Have they surveyed that or did they just guess? That? What's that? Since 61, have there been any surveys since then? I don't know. Are they just saying that it didn't? It's, didn't test it, but it's not a vape pipe collection. But at the time, what they were doing, they're doing two things. They were measuring how much it actually had subsided, but they were also measuring how how fast it would subside. So, for example, from one six-month period, maybe or every quarter, they would measure. The next quarter, they would measure, and for every one of those pins, they would have a, a change in elevation, and they would say that it's, it's moving at 0.04 feet per month, something like that. So you're moving about four hundredths of an inch in a month. And the next month it might be two one hundredths of an inch. So they're saying it's no longer it's no longer subsiding very quickly. Although in the night in the last survey that I have is 1959, there were still some of the pins were moving on the order of about oh an inch during that during that year. So not well. It, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's all relative, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, for example, how much, how many feet of subsidence were there? Well, people probably have some ideas of their own. I was talking to Tony Roth up at the Bureau of Mines and Geology, and he had just a couple of years ago he had just come from talking to an old timer who swore there was 30 feet of subsidence in that area. <laughs> I was talking to somebody else who was a geologist out of the pit. He said he had heard 20 feet. So going back to the reported 12 feet, this is a 12 foot long stick. The ceiling is almost 12 feet long, or 12 feet high. So that would be 12 feet of subsidence if it was vertical. Give you an idea how much it was. In the Anaconda records, going through the 1959 report of what happened through 1958, the most I can find is 8.7 feet, which is that blue mark up there that I can't reach. Still quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's a That's lot. a whole basement. Pardon? That's a whole basement. <sighs> yeah. I mean, like, that's your house sliding into your basement. <laughs> I was watching the fire department out here put the new banners out yesterday. I was trying to guess how high was 30 feet. Maybe the top of <laughs> so all I can document is 8.7. It's reported 12 feet. Either way, that's a lot of subsidence in that area. Wow. Yeah. If you're living on top of it, you're, you're experiencing quite a bit going on in there. Let me turn my pointer around here. All right. Just like that. You should have given Let me leave that for you, Kim. Oh, he's got one. He, he <laughs> wants to use that one. <laughs> so from those pins and the actual measurements, I made up this map to show what we officially know. Here's the Trevona. There's the Emma. Right here, by 1959, was, they started putting pins out in 40 and 42. It was just not all at once. So mm -hmm. during that time frame, I know we had six foot of subsidence up there, over by the high school, about one and a half feet. Right down here, here's the town pump, 8.3 here, 8.7 here and here, over on Gold Street, 6.9 feet, 4.9, 3.1, 1.4, and 2.5, and that's as far as the readings go. I don't have any readings down in here, although this is the Tan Pump corporate office, and I know that there were several houses along here that had impact, were impacted as well. And many houses up here from the View High School up in this area were impacted as well, and businesses right across the street were all, for the most part, uh, heavily impacted with problems. So this is the Dave Piper collection itself. It does look very interesting. It's got 23 boxes came in of just stuff. It had all these files in there. They were not alphabetical. They were not chronological. There was no idea what they were. There were four boxes of different sorted materials and three boxes of miscellaneous. So how did they come to be here at the archives? Well, from talking to Matt Vincent, he thought he might be here, but. Matt Benson was involved in this back when he worked for the planning department for Butte. And he said back then, we had the Anaconda properties broken up, and so Dennis Washington took part of the old Anaconda properties. That's now the Continental Pit, in that area in there, the concentrator of the <laughs> dual tailings. Arco had the piece, they got the Berkeley Pit, and some other properties around there. And also two other entities, New Butte Mining, took that, Blackjack Mining is going to be mining in that area one of these days. And also there was one called Montana Mining Properties. It was another enterprise of somebody coming in and thinking they can make some money out of 
uh, mining some areas that had been mined previously. Well, the problem was that MMP ran out of, for whatever reason, the old back taxes. And so Matt Benson said that what happened is the county came in and said, well, to collect back taxes, what assets did they have that we could seize to pay for the back taxes? Well, what they found was there were warehouses full of, he just, he just described it as just literally just stuff, just junk over there, piles, just piles and piles and piles of material in there, including the Dave Piper collection. That was one part of it. How it got to the warehouse, Matt didn't know. I can't find any information on how it got to the warehouse. Well, something more interesting to me about that, too, is once it got to the warehouse, for some reason, it was a property of Dave Piper. It didn't belong to Anaconda, it didn't belong to Arco, it didn't belong to Dennis Washington. It was in the warehouse, but it was part of there. So there was a person by the name of Jim Nolson. Now, several people knew Dave Piper. How many knew Dave or Jim Nolson? A few who know Jim Nolson, too. Dave Piper started as a young engineer. He went to Montana Tech. He started as a young engineer. And he would be one of those who would be called to investigate all the subsidence claims in the, all around the area. And he eventually rose through the ranks to become a chief engineer at Anaconda, where he would write the subsidence reports to the corporation big wigs themselves. And then after he retired, he started his own consulting company. And so people like Larry Hoffman worked for him when he was a consultant. And he did different things around here. So for example, in 1985, he was the engineer of record when he took the Emma head frame down or the Emma back in 1985. So he has all sorts of pictures of that being taken out and a good chronology of what was going on. <clears throat> the other person who was playing in here, Jim Nolson, <clears throat> they brought him in. He was an underground superintendent of some level when the mines shut down in 1982. And he went off and he became a consulting mining engineer. When he died, the obituary was written up in the mining magazine as he was one of the foremost underground experts in the West. Well, he was, he was in Spokane. He was brought in, hired, to evaluate what was in the warehouse. So he went ahead and he put a value on the collection. Jim McCarthy has been working for the last umpteen decades on the Anaconda collection, along with John Paul, of going through all this records the Anaconda company has donated to, or the ARCO has donated to the archives in here. And Jim Nolson has a very, very detailed spreadsheet of, what, hundreds of boxes, and maps, and all the other that Jim and John are trying to make sense of. So, Matt Vincent couldn't remember. I called him, and he was on the road and trying to remember something that happened 30 years ago, back several careers of his ago. And he said, well, he remembered that they found the, the collection over there in the warehouse. Jim Nolson put a value on there. Turns out it belonged to the family. So they did negotiations with the family. And he thought he paid for that out of the grant money that the county had. He couldn't remember how much, though. And so those were moved into the courthouse. And Matt said he used those for years and years over there. Whenever there would be a complaint of subsidence around you, he would immediately go to there and see if there was some information. And he left around 2004, but in 2003, all the records were moved over here. He was talking, Ellen Crane was involved, and it was decided they were better off over here than at the courthouse. So they moved in here, and that's where they sat from 2003 on, until Brian Leach went through them and built his own database. I started in 2019. I wasn't aware, aware that Brian had done much until I got in his database last year. So he's, he's got a wonderful database. I wish he would have had it a few years ago. <laughs> so we're merging the two of them together because he's got a lot of good information in his that I didn't capture in mine. So what is it? What is the collection itself? There's over 1,500 complaints. And this is a combination of both open pit and underground, primarily underground complaints. There were 1,100 of those complaints that actually had a separate file. <coughs> involved in there. So the, the files are fascinating because what they would do is they would have everywhere from the initial telephone complaint, the actual slip from 1940, 1946, along with all the other tracking information going mm -hmm. through there until the final disposition of the case. So it'll take a while to go through and read each one of those 1100 to make sense of them. 
and then to go ahead and put those into a database. So of the 23 boxes we got, 16 of those had those 1100, so those were in no order. So part of it, we went ahead and put them into an alphabetical order so we could at least find them in the future. Also, four boxes, because we had a cross-reference file back in the old days, so we had the individual files, but also we had a separate sheets of paper for every address up and down. So if you're on Park Street, for example, there's probably 100 plus files, going, sheets of paper going down Park. Colorado, the same way. Montana, the same way. So you can cross-reference if somebody wanted to know what's going on in Montana next door, they can just go to the file and pull out a whole section of maybe the 400 block of Montana and see who is doing what. And then they can go back to the big files that they wanted to. We also have three boxes of just miscellaneous maps, notebooks, reports, and we now have an Excel database where if somebody comes in and says, I want to know, here's my address, we can actually pull the file and show them what's going on in that area. So here's what it looks like. We have all these boxes of files, and close up is usually the name and the address in there, and many of them are stamped settled in there. So we left them as were because to me, having it settled was kind of interesting to see rather than reboxing them and putting them into brand new file folders. And we had others that are very thick reports of different styles, trying to find out what's in these things and why they were tabbed. And then we have several boxes of just notebooks, just different things. Most of them are survey notes, where the surveyors would go out and take the readings off of the pins, going up and down the alleys and streets, and they would record them, and so we have those. So if anybody really wants to go ahead and find out what's going on, they can put those in, and calculate the measurements themselves. So, something you guys can do at the Tim and John show in the future. I don't think we're going to go there. <laughs> so, we have two types of subsidence here in view we had to worry about the trough subsidence and the chimney subsidence. So, a lot of it we think of as being like this. Oh my goodness, there's a mine shaft that opens up in my backyard. There was a famous story a few years ago of one underneath a child's place, a swing set. It does happen. That picture I showed early on of all those dots on that map, of all the shafts around you, a lot of them are known, a lot of them aren't. So we have old shafts. We have underground workings where they actually go ahead and line the ore out, and they would come too close to the surface. Instead of leaving a crown pillar there at the top, which wouldn't break through, that they would mine closer and eventually it would fall, it subside, cave in, and open to the surface. And the third one is this surface sinking or opening from cesspools. I came across that and I thought, what in the world is a cesspool? And then I realized that's an outhouse. Yep. <laughs> and then to be particular, the outhouse is a building on top, the cesspool is the vault underneath. In the old days, you wouldn't put a concrete ring in there, you just dig a hole. And then when you pull the outhouse out, you finally got indoor plumbing. What do you do with the hole? Well, you should properly fill it. If you don't properly fill it, eventually it's going to slough in. I used to live on Alabama, Caledonia, right below the, the head frame of the Anselmo head frame. It was interesting, there was a file on that where the lady said, I've got a hole right outside my driveway. So they sent a squad of engineers to evaluate it and found out it was an old outhouse, an old cesspool down there. There was no mining from the Anselmo in that direction, but there was a, a two-foot hole out there that just hadn't been properly capped. Some of the other problems we had here with the old shafts is traditionally when they capped it, they may put like a foot thick piece of planks all across there. And then they filled dirt on top of that. So they thought that they had it all taken care of and it worked for a long time. But wood deteriorates here in view. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So eventually when that wood deteriorates, it collapses and down it goes. Mm -hmm. And that's where you go find other things. <laughs> but, uh, Tony Roth has several places around view he's watching just to see that happen. Mm -hmm. This trough subsidence is really what happened down there in the area here. So when you have a nice level, when everything starts to sink, you get this U-shape in the ground where you have major subsidence in the center you have less subsidence on the side, kind of this little bathtub effect. Mm -hmm. And that's what the picture I was showing you before, we had 8.7 feet in the center, mm -hmm. and it might feather out to 1.4 by the high school, and about one foot down by the Truoma. So this process, we had very few complaints, by the way, of the chimney subsidence, 
In terms of sh old shafts, there were, I think, seven <coughs> shafts that were reported in the 1100 files. And of those, they were, for the most part, pre-Anaconda. That Anaconda would take a look at them, they're more towards the uptown area, above the Emma, and Anaconda would come out and say, it's not on any of the maps. We have no maps. Uh, Tom Malloy and others will talk about there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shafts around Butte. We have about 500 mines or so in the Butte area. And the old timers might dig a six foot shaft, exploration shaft, they didn't find anything. And they wouldn't properly cap it, whatever properly means, that after 80 years, 100 years, there would be a problem. So they investigated those, they would fill them, even though it wasn't their problem. But some of them were their problem because they had bought the mineral rights and the property in that area, so they were responsible, so they would take care of it. But there were several that they had to deal with. In terms of cesspools, I think there were six in there, six outhouse complaints that they had to investigate and deal with. For the most part, they would say, it's your problem, but they would offer to bring gravel in. So what are they complaining about? Well, underground, blasting noises and vibrations. I've talked to a couple of people who say that their relatives swear they could hear the miners talking underground. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, one, you're 200 to 600, 800 feet below ground, so but they could certainly feel the vibrations of the blasting. Many complained about blasting at 4 o'clock in the morning. It would just go ahead and wake them up. Cracks in the buildings, lots of cracks, both in the buildings and the base of the foundations. Walls that were tilted. Uh, windows and doors that wouldn't open properly. W windows that would actually have cracks in them. They say it wasn't there yesterday, it's there today. Broken sidewalks, broken gas and sewer lines. They would complain of a hole in the ground. Now that could be a trench, it could be a depression, it could be an opening. There's all sorts of different things like that. Unfortunately, this is the one that was to me of also of interest. We're talking about several people who have apartment buildings down there. Many of them of the apartment building owners were retired and they had half a dozen to 10 units and they were going to use that for their retirement. <clears throat> While the cracking was happening, their tenants were moving out. And uh, the other tenants were kind of fearful, both in the pit area and in the underground area, of what was going on. <laughs> Businesses were losing customers. There were bars down there, there were grocery <laughs> stores down there, there were drug stores down there, <clears throat> and they were losing businesses. People just didn't want to frequent those areas. And also this loss of value. I showed that slide early on where the guy was saying, we can't loan in here. I ran across several others that said, in this area, it, we can, it's worth this, but if it was outside, it would be worth twice that much. Mm -hmm. So it was like a 50% nick for living inside that area. <clears throat> and this idea can't sell. There were many complaints, a couple of dozen complaints in those files of we can't sell our house. Will the Anaconda Company buy it? Anaconda chose not to. They didn't want to go ahead and be the property owners Church. of all these individual houses because it wasn't important to them. They would buy houses around the pit for expansion, but not around this area down by Emma. <clears throat> and then this is the one, I found several of these. You paid my neighbor across the street, why not me? <laughs> that it just didn't seem fair that John next door gets paid and I don't because my house is having problems too. But realistically what's happening down in there, in the area we're talking about, for the most part those houses were built oh, pre-1900. At least by 1920 all the houses that they were built. So when this problem was happening in the mid-40s, a lot of those houses were already 30 and 40 years old. And so the Anaconda Company would come in and they would find the door stick, but the wall, all the floors were slooping towards the center. And they knew immediately when they walked in, the problem was when the house was built, you put the floor joist down and you put like a six by six post underneath it to support it. Well, over a period of 30 years, that deteriorates out of the bottom. And it starts to slump, it starts to slump. It's got nothing to do with mining, but you've got all of this in there. People were saying, but, 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 but. And others, the foundations, they would have a basement with dirt walls. Well, eventually that kind of slump in. Now, whether or not it was accelerated by the blasting from the underground, there was no admission by Anaconda of anything like that. So there are a lot of these problems associated with it. Also, many people put additions on their houses, like they put a porch on their house. Well, the porch wasn't tied properly into the house. As time went on, it started to separate. And so you'd have maybe the porch would be off 
and this wood. So there was a lot of complaints like that. Many, many different ideas of what's happening in my house. So this is Emma Park today. It's got the beautiful little house. And uh, Travona, as you come off the highway, it has this big butte sign on there as well. So those are, those are what it looks like now. The Emma back then, this is what the Emma looked like. It had the head frame and it had four smokestacks over here from the boilers. So this is part of the Smith's collection. Now this is looking towards the south. This is looking down towards the highway. If we turn around and look the other direction, up towards uptown, there's the head frame and there's the one, two, three, four smokestacks. But there's Park Street up in there. <laughs> You're right smack in town. It's really amazing how close it was to town. And so you have all those houses around it. And one of the stories about any kind of mining is gold is where you find it. That they might like to mine it elsewhere, but it doesn't exist elsewhere. You have to mine it where it is. And so that's why they went ahead and put the head frame there. What was the one put next to the Finland? Uh, the smokehouse. 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 Right across the street from the Finland. I love that one. So here's what they were mining. They were mining manganese. It's this beautiful rotocrosite ore. Really pretty, it makes good jewelry. And it's mainly used in steel production. About 80 90% of it is used. It makes a very rugged steel. So back in World War II, we wanted rugged steel for tanks and battleships and other materials. So manganese was definitely in demand. We quit mining manganese here in the U.S. in 1970 was the last mine here. So that's 50 years ago was the last mine. So now we're importing it mainly from South Africa, Gabon, which is two, two countries down from Nigeria over in Africa, and Australia. So that's where it's coming from now. It's a beautiful, beautiful rock. When it's gem quality, people like it. So where is it mined today? Well, once again, you mine it where you can find it. The Appalachia area has some up in here, a little bit up there perhaps in Maine, a little bit over here in California. Good luck mining in California these days. <laughs> and there's a lot down here in New Mexico and Arizona. And there's one here, the Hermosa, Hermosa Project. The Hermosa Project down in Patagonia, south of Tucson. They're trying to get it going. And of course, the neighbors don't want it there for all sorts of reasons. We moved in there. And, uh, NIMBYs, not in my backyard, is something that we have around. And you'll see up in here, there's one isolated little place called the Emma Mine. <laughs> there's no other manganese anywhere around here. The little sniffs down here in Wyoming and Colorado, but that was the Emma Mine. So that's why they mined it there. So once again, gold is where you find it. Manganese is where you find it. That's why we, why we mine where we work. So if we take a look down Main Street, we just look straight down Main Street, there would be mercury, silver, porphyry, gold, and platinum. The intersection's going down. This is the Emma vein, as it came on up here. And it would come to the surface probably around Silver Street. Now the way that they would do it, the shaft itself was over Emma Park, a little bit to the west. There would be a shaft going down vertically. And then they would, so the shaft be, for example, over there. Then they would have a drift that came across at the 400 foot level, at the 600 foot level, at the 800 foot level. Every 200 feet, you'd have a drift coming across to the vein. And for the vein, consider it kind of like a, a very thin sheet cake. It just kind of droops on down. It's a sheet cake going down. And you're trying to mine that whole sheet cake out from underground. So what you do is you go ahead and get into the vein and you have a little railroad track that goes this way to haul the ore back to the shaft. The one goes over here to the end. You go down another 200 feet of that shaft, you drift over to the vein again, and you mine along here. And as you're mining from railroad track, then you put your, 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 your stoke miners, you have all this ore in there, and that's where you come in with all of the square set timbers that we had in there to go ahead and support it, backfill, whatever you can, and mine as much of the ore out as you can. And hopefully you don't mine to the surface because there might be something up here on the surface you don't want to have happen. So this went outcrop over here at Silver. <coughs> and looking at the traces of what they have, it would outcrop at Silver over here. And then over here on Montana, it would outcrop about between Silver and uh, Porphyry. Yeah, Porphyry, Silver and Porphyry. 
and all the way over here towards the hospital, it would be down down towards gold. So just think of it just kind of a sheet, just going ahead and just drifting on down. This was in line. Now, as a result, anything down in this area would be, unfortunately, in the subsidence zone. Anything up here, <laughs> mining wouldn't touch it because it's on solid ground. There's nothing to subside up in that area. So if you happen to have a house here, you might have a claim. If you have a house here, you wouldn't have a claim. Here's an example of that. This is what it looked like on Montana Street. <clears throat> the vein is not uniform. It's kind of ebbs and flows as it goes across. But here's the main Emma vein in here. And here's where they intersected at the 500 level, the 400 level, 300 level. And you didn't do any mining up in here. There's no 100 level or 200 level. But it comes up with outcrops between silver and porphyry. Now, if you have a house over here, there's nothing going on underneath you. So there's no claim that you have. If you have a house here, wow, as they undercut that house, unless they backfill it, fill it with something there, it's going to start subsiding, keeping on out, and it may come to the surface. So you may have 20 foot taken out in here, and by the time it gets to the surface, you might have two or three or four feet of subsidence. It's going to kind of fill itself as it goes down. <clears throat> also, you notice we have these other veins, the Nelly vein, the Nelly South vein, the Ella vein. These are also mined. But, so when you're over here, if you have a house way down here in aluminum, these guys were also affected, but not nearly as severely. So that's what they had to do with those. Just looking straight into the site. Is, is there a record for how the closest they came to the surface in depth? Did they come up 200 feet from the surface? Is there a record of how high they came up? Yeah, well, they talk about the, the number of whatever level they were on. And 200 feet below the surface is the most that I've seen. So they stoked up from 200? Yeah, they would have stoked. Well, it's a question. Did they stove up to the 100 foot level or how far up they did? Is, is there a document for that? I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. There's a lot in here that somebody who wants to write a master's thesis could probably dig in here and spend some time, or somebody new to Butte in your copious spare time, you can just get in there and have one fun. Doesn't Tony often working on the stove maps? He's been working on the stove maps. He's stone put them together yeah. so that you can actually work your way up. And I don't remember what his top <coughs> scope is, though. His top, uh, he has a level maps in there, but I don't remember yeah. what his top level is, 200 one. Yes. Well, the 300 foot level of the Pavonia, there's a drift that runs straight under the East Junior High, right through the really? middle of the field, runs right under the school, the 300 foot level. And the 300 foot level of the Pavonia isn't 300 feet below the surface, it's probably less than that, because when you call a 300 foot level, it's measured from the constant point, so it's probably maybe. Hmm. If you go up by the Mountain Con, uh -huh. if you go up by the Mountain Con engine room, it's, if you go down there, the stove would show that about 35 feet, feet below the surface, it's all taken out of it. Well, do you know, as he mined under the east, as he, on the 300 foot, we're talking 300 foot, up, 300 foot below the surface condition. But that's 300 foot from the from, from measurement from to get to the, yeah. you know, the yeah. engineer. 300 foot like from the car. isn't necessarily 300. But from whatever mind. distance down they were, did they actually mine ore from there to the surface? But they didn't go all the way to the surface. But they would have mined it upwards. They would have mined. So there's a question of how much rock was still left in there, the crown pillar I was talking about. If it's sturdy enough to hold forever, or if it's close enough with all the fracturing we had here in view, that eventually it's going to come in. And right now in the stoke books, Tony, right as we speak, is actually doing the uh, Emma, and he's done the Travonia. So he's actually doing stoke books for the Emma as we speak. I hope you've all had a chance to see Tony Roth in action up in here. He's what, almost eight foot seven himself. <laughs> <laughs> Just an amazing guy, and he's trying to digitize all the stoke books he can find for all the mines around view. And he's hoping to put it into a three dimensional view eventually. His so uh, brown bag is on our YouTube, so you can look on our YouTube channel for him. Yeah, so take a look. It's marvelous what he's done. It's just amazing to, yeah. to watch him go through. When did they stop mining uh, Emma? Emma stopped mining in 59. 1959 was the last of the winter. Sometime earlier than that, the Travona, early 50s, I think, for the Travona was the last for the mining there. So as a result, there's no further mining in there to cause more disturbance. So any subsidence was caused by all the mining up to 1959. Emma also has a claim because that was the last one to use mules. 
Hmm. The first mules we could find were used in 1898 hmm. underground. We think they were used before that. We can't document it. Thousands of mules. And as soon as electricity came along and you could go ahead and get electric locomotives underground, we chose to use that versus mules. A lot easier. Yeah. And uh, Emma was the last one to go ahead and pull them out in the early 30s. <laughs> so here's what was in each of those complaint files. What would happen? There would be an initial complaint. So that would be a little telephone slip I'm talking about. David Armstrong called and he says there's a hole in the backyard. He's complaining about cracks in his foundation. So the in immediately have generated a memo to the engineering department. Please go out and investigate. Here's as much as we know from the complaint. It would also generate legal to have somebody go down to the courthouse and see who actually owns that property. Several of them were complaints by renters who had no standing. It wasn't their property. Others, there was one of a church that was being affected. And it was a defunct church. And there was a former member who was trying to complain, but it didn't belong to him, so he had no standing. And so they had to negotiate with the, the church itself, which is out of Washington, the long, long ways negotiation. <laughs> then, <clears throat> The engineers would then have three separate things they would do. They would send the first wave, typically two to four engineers out, and what they would do, they write off a couple pages. Uh, what do we see? It's a two-story building. It's made of wood or it has a brick veneer. It has three bedrooms upstairs. It has a kitchen. It has a basement. The basement is timber or concreted in. Then they send out a second group of engineers with their tape measures, and they'd walk around and say, OK, what is the complaint? And they would measure every crack they could find in the house, every crack they could find in the foundation, every crack they could find in the sidewalks or anything else around there. And then they send out a third squad, usually another two or three or four engineers, who would take a look and see, is any of this caused by mining in the area? Because when these things would come up to the surface, there would be quite often a surface expression. Sometimes there would be an offset in the streets going across. And they could trace it from house to house to house and they would know that it was there. So we see that every once in a while. For example, up on Caledonia, there was a fault that came straight down Caledonia, about a block and a half from the Immaculate Conception Church over, and it came right down through about four streets. So they just tracked that on down, and they would say there's going to be problems here, and they'd be prepared to pay that off. So it was really quite interesting. But now as you drive along Caledonia up in there, you don't see that. It's all been fixed and repaired over the years. <coughs> but, so what they would do is they'd make an evaluation. Is it caused by mining? And if so, what percent was caused by mining? So sometimes they would say, we did it. And other times they'd say, well, it's 25% us or 10% us. And that's all they'd be willing to do. And then they would decide, OK, if it was us, if we did it, they would have a contractor come out. There were two contractors they used. They would come out and they'd do a complete evaluation to say, <clears throat> if we were to fix this thing, we've got to put this in, this place in, these two by fours, shingles, everything else. And they come up with a number to bring it up to snuff, whatever that might mean. <clears throat> and that would be the evaluation that Anaconda would use to start off with. In 76 of these 1,100 cases, they would ask the Board of Realtors to go out and they send three realtors out. And they would make an evaluation and they would say, well, here is worth this as it is right now. If it was outside that zone, it would be worth a whole lot more. But inside this zone, if you fixed it up, it would be worth this. And the Anaconda would use that then as a starting point for negotiations. And then the negotiations themselves <coughs> were with the landowner, with the owner himself, of it's going to cost you $3,000 to fix it. Here's our offer. And then quite often, it would be taken. Sometimes it was protracted. They would say, no, it's worth $10,000. And the condo company would say, okay, we'll go up to $3,250. And that would be about it. Hmm. But Anaconda's philosophy, if we broke it, we'll fix it. We're not going to pay for pain and suffering. We're not going to pay for loss of value. We're not going to pay for loss of income. We will pay to fix it. So whatever that amounts to, we'll give you the check. We'll let you fix it. We're not going to fix it. We'll let you fix it. <laughs> and the last thing they would do is they would ask for a perpetual release. And this, to me, was the legal interesting part in here. So this perpetual release, if you sign it, it's a couple of three pages where what you're saying is the company, in exchange for my money, the company is released from all damages to date. So however my house is right now, fine. That this will pay for it. I can't come back later on and say, wait a minute, I found this brick wall is crumbling. Tough. Everything to date is gone. 
Second thing, they have no damage, no liability, no damage from, there's no damage to the company for future damages to your building or property. So therefore, if it keeps subsiding, tough. We've already paid you off. No liability to support the surface or structures. And we have the perpetual right to continue mining underneath the surface. <laughs> and finally, it's binding on heirs. So if you have to will it to your kids or any future owners. So we have a, a couple of dozen in there where somebody would come back and say, I bought this house and it's subsiding. And they would go back and say, well, 1946, you signed, the previous owner signed the release. Therefore, we will not, we cannot and will not do anything for you. And there were a couple in there where people signed the release in 1946, 1948, and it would turn out maybe 15, 20 years ago, uh, later, they would come back to the company and say, we still have subsidence. And the company would say, well, you signed this piece of paper back then, and they would write a letter to the company saying, we had no idea, we didn't realize what we were signing. And they had gone to company around. Sorry. Isn't that the end on title search? Sir? I have no idea. Okay. Not being a lawyer, I don't know. I assume it is because it's recorded. It's a very long document, and I assume it's recorded. All right, so let's get slide, slide, summary slides in here. What really happened? We have 1,115 individual cases in those boxes of the files. Anaconda said that they were responsible for some damage in 433 of them. They denied 424. A lot of it was denied because there was no mining in the area or for various reasons. The Butte Board of Realtors was called in for an evaluation 76 times. In 452 of them, 452, Anaconda actually went ahead and paid it out. The reason this is different in here, this is settlement not only for the underground but for the pit. And so, there were some in here that what I liked was up by the original mine. There was a lady who had a house just the other side of the original mine. And for some reason, they brought in an oil truck, spilled oil during a heavy wind, blew onto her car. So they paid him $3.50 for a car wash back then. <laughs> so there are some like that. In the 452, 359 actually signed a perpetual release. And almost all of those are down in that Emma Park to Travona area. There were 55 miscellaneous non-mining issues of these 1,115. There was one lady, and we started a file on her, she complained about chipmunks around the mine. <laughs> so, so much. A lot of them also were people complaining there's a fence down alongside the mine. It's not my property, but there's a fence down, please fix it. Or there's a hole across the street in the mining area, please fix it. So some of those actually generated a file, but they weren't anything special. Unfortunately, there's over 200 that they started off and they had a major complaint and we have no information on what happened. We have no idea why it was caused. And then the last one, and how speedy, Anaconda for the most part tried to go ahead and work with people quickly. So 645 of the 1115 were settled in less than a year. Now here's the order when, when the year was first filed. So you can see back previous to 1940, there's very few complaints of any kind previous to 1940. And then when they started mining in 1940, in the spring of 1941, the complaints started coming in. And oh my goodness, here in 1944, that's almost one every other day of complaints coming in. So you're living there, you've been in your house for 30 or 40 years, and all of a sudden you're having problems. Your sewer pipe breaks and it floods your basement. Well, the Anaconda Company will come in and they'll pay for the plumber's bill, and they'll, play, they'll pay for whatever you lost in there but the fact you have to live with sewage being pumped out of your basement and whatever the residual is in the future, that's not their problem. And then it gradually <coughs> came down. And over here, when the pit started up, the pit started in the 58. And so here's a combination of both pit and underground in here, this residual in here. And you can see as the pit went ahead and cranked up from 66 through 73, 74, there were some complaints from the pit that were all documented in the day piper grouping in there. And the last one in here, how long did it take them to resolve? Well, most of them resolved within zero to one year. Most of them. There's a few that took a little bit longer. Some of these other ones out in here, the reason it took longer to resolve, a couple of reasons. One is the owners were not in a negotiating mood. 
They wanted 10,000, the company was only offering 2,000, whatever it took to fix it. Others, it hadn't quit subsiding. So for example, as you go down Main Street to where the turnoff is into St. James, right there was the Jensen Drugstore. And the Jensen Drugstore, in the files, it said that was a hot spot. That's a hot one, according to Anaconda. It kept going. And the area across, just next to the uh, subway, just down from the subway, there was another hot area. And it subsided and subsided and subsided. And so the ACM was saying, let's not negotiate right now because it's not fair to them. It hasn't finished subsiding yet. So we're going to hold off until it finishes subsiding, and then we'll make an offer. So some of the people had to live there for years and years and years waiting for the subsidence to quit. In the meantime, you're living with all the broken fracture, uh, crack, and everything else to go on with that. So it took quite a while. Incidentally, when they, when they went ahead and uh, took care of this, a lot of them were only for two or $3,000. Two or $3,000 may not sound like a lot. And even today, when you, when you bring it up in today's dollars, it doesn't amount to much. Uh, so, for example, that first slide I showed you where the lady was saying she could get $1,500 for her house. When you escalate that using the Consumer Price Index, which for real estate is a very poor measure, that house will only be worth about $25,000 today. I checked that Zillow says that house is worth $125,000 today. <laughs> but to me, a better measure is back then, a house may be worth, say, $6,000 on the market and you would have $2,000 of damage. Or it might have $3,000 of damage. So if you have a $6,000 house, you have a $3,000 of damage. Think about it right now. If you have a house worth $250,000, and we knock on your door and say, we did $125,000 of damage to your house. Wow, just the impact of that, of having to fix up a house that has, say, one third or one quarter of the value of the house has to be fixed up. We're not talking ten or $15,000. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars. And that was the equivalent of what you had to deal with back then. Plus, the other impact is you're dealing with the Anaconda Company. Uh -huh. Today, when you think about the largest companies in the world, you think of Google, you think of um, Microsoft, Amazon, all these big ones like that. Well, back in the 20s, the Anaconda Mining Company was number four in the world, fourth largest. So it's you against the Anaconda Company. And they deliberately negotiated one-on-one, -on -one, that there were no such thing as a class action back then that you would have today. So it's you against the mighty Anaconda Company. And all throughout the files it says, we're, we want to be fair with the people. We want to be fair that if we're broken, we'll fix it. And so this riddle throughout there with the Anaconda Company, dealing with people, people could walk into the Anaconda building, and they stopped people on the street from Anaconda and asked what was going on. So they deliberately tried to take care of all this, but you're working with an old, old area of houses that are falling apart to begin with, and it's just difficult to come up with a fair estimate of what was going on. And like I say, that if your neighbor gets paid and you don't get paid, when you look at, say, Colorado Street, all the way down, house after house after house, got paid. You look at Montana, all the way out down, there's empty lots all, all through the Lloyd building area, Lloyd lot block, all throughout there. And as you drive around down in that lower area, there's empty lots where there are old houses that may have been torn down because of sites, may have been torn down for other reasons, but it's just kind of a toothless spot in many areas. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've come up with now to the uh, Anaconda. The Emma mine is a mighty mine. It produced millions of tons of ore. Of manganese is necessary for the war effort, but it was torn down in 1985, and we've been trying to restore the whole area of view since. So, okay. That's it. Wow.